today we will uh, talk on an approach to a child with uh, wetting. So wetting or incontinence is an important problem uh, in children and it can be present during the daytime or nighttime. So there are a lot of terminologies are involved. So what you need to know is what is neuresis, what is incontinence, what is nocturia, what is encopresis, what is overactive bladder and what is detrosar external sphincter dysenergia. Old terminology in neurosis means failure to achieve normal bladder control in a child more than 5 year old in the absence of any pathological abnormality. Now incontinence means involuntary loss of urine or leak. So it's a pathological inability to control and it can be like an urge incontinence, stress incontinence or overflow incontinence. So that's the difference. A neurosis is a failure to achieve a normal body control while incontinence is an abnormal and pathological. Now ICC's definitions came up in the year 2006 where they said incontinence means uncontrollable leakage of urine and they classified incontinence and uh, neurosis is any leakage that occurred during the night which is a bit confusing because the older definition was much clear. Then they said that daytime incontinence is a leak during the day and dysfunctional wording is inappropriate contraction. So the older definitions were actually much better than the newer ones. Now primary nocturnal neurosis means nocturnal wetting in a child who has never been dry on a consecutive night for longer than six months. Secondary nocturnal neurosis, the child has been dry for six months or more, usually not due to an organic cause and in some cases stressful event may be the uh, trigger for it. Development of bladder control, the number of voids per day are very high during infancy. Whereas the bladder control uh, happens like around two and a half years in girls and uh, two, two years to three years in boys. Up to four years this process may continue and the control pattern is like night bowel control, day bowel control, day bladder control and then night bladder control which comes last. Now during infancy the voiding is a reflex act. So the brainstem controls the reflex, cortical inhibition is poorly developed, however cortical input is invariably present and storage is at low pressure and voiding at higher pressures can be there in infancy due to dysanergia. A child with wetting can be classified into a primary or secondary as I told earlier. A secondary means uh, less than 6 months of gap, uh, then nocturnal or diurnal and if it is a primary then primary monosymptomatic nocturnal aneurysis is the medical term for bedwetting. Diurnal incontinence can be functional which means that there is a problem with the bladder function and not a structure or a neurology or it can be a problem with the neuropathy where there is a problem with the spinal cord and it can be structural where there are problems like an ectopic ureter or a, a problems with the urethra. So is wetting a problem during the night only? So that's an important thing you need to uh, ask. If it is there during the day and night then you probably know that the daytime problem is also there which is due to functional problems often. Is wetting new? Was the child continent before? Was it continuous or intermittent? If somebody has been continuously uh, incontinent throughout then you know that it can be a neurological cause or because of a structural cause like an epispadius. So are there normal voiding epicycles in between in addition to the wetting? So this is typical of a child with an ectopic ureter then any preventive body posturing like Vincent's curtsy which is a leg crossing and squatting and other features of bladder instability like urgency, frequency, urge incontinence and the constipation. So these things, this is a typical Vincent's curtsy also known as a holding maneuver which is a feature of a functional uh, abnormality in the child. Voiding diary is recording the number of voids, number of leaks and this is very important part of evaluation and uh, the history often gives a clue. If it is a pure nighttime incontinent, then this is often called a primary nocturnal aneurysis, which is bedwetting. If the child has been dry before, that is often a secondary cause. And uh, in this condition, organic causes are very unlikely. It's often functional. If they continuous throughout, and then organic causes are likely, like an epispadias or an ectopic ureter or a urogenital sinus. Intermittent daytime wetting is usually functional. So the functional wetting often is not there during the night. So wetting soon after voiding is often due to vaginal reflux or labial adhesions. Associated bowel problems 
uh, like constipation or in or in uh, fecal incontinence can be a feature of spina bifida or sacral agenesis. A clinical examination, you look for a palpable bladder, expressible bladder and fecal loading. In Italia, you look for epispadias, spine, you look for hairy patch, swelling, sinus and then neurological examination of the gait, lower limb reflexes. Then uh, this is typical of a labial additions where there is a, a hold up of the urine above the vagina, above the fused labia and that can be a reason for orbiting. This is a typical example of a spina bifida culta where tuft of hair is present. It's a neurological cause. This is an epispandias where the sphincters are deficient and this is a problem with the sacral agenesis, partial sacral agenesis where the neurology is a problem. So urine routine examination, urine culture, urine osmolality, ultrasonography to look for duplication anomalies, hydrourethers, then upper tract dilatation, residual volume is an important examination during an ultrasonogram, exit of the spine and maybe an MRI to look for spine abnormalities and an MCU may be also needed in some children. So urodynamics is the last investigation we do uh, in so those the severe problems. So when to suspect an ectopic uterine? So this is typically a problem in girls who have always been wet. That means since childhood or whenever the child has been born. Um, the problem is more during the day. In the night it's less because of the pooling and gravity. Normal voiding cycles are there. So the bladder is functioning normally. No features of instability or neuropathy. So they don't have frequency urgency, but there's a constant dampening of the uh, uh, underpads. So ultrasound may reveal a hydroureter. Uh, so that is how an ec the ectopic ureter opens beyond the bladder neck outside the bladder. So you often see a drooping lily appearance, which is um, with a, a poorly functioning the upper moiety of the duplex, which is responsible for the ectopic ureter. So when to suspect a neuropathy? When the incontinence is severe, it's there on day and night, it's been there since birth. Then bowel problems are also present, constipation or soiling. The bladder is expressible, there may be abnormalities in gait or reflux, uh, spine abnormalities uh, like an occult or overt features. Ultrasound may show uh, severe bilateral hydronephrosis, thick in the bladder, and MCU may show abnormal bladder shape. Now, meningomyelocele can be obvious or sometimes an MRI may reveal a tethered card and that's a typical appearance of a neurogenic bladder which is known as Christmas tree appearance. Now functional problems. Functional problems are where there is no structural abnormality or a neurological abnormality. So these are all problems with the bladder dysfunction. So they often have daytime symptoms, frequency, urgency and urgent continence, constipation, squatting maneuvers like what we have seen earlier, they may have recurrent UTIs, ultrasound is often normal and uroflow abnormalities can be there. Uh, now they are classified like uh, detrusor instability, urge syndrome, dysfunctional voiding, deferred voiding, lazy bladder or sometimes very severe ones are non-neurogenic, neurogenic bladders. They may be a detrusor instability or Google incontinence. These children have typically a void only during cracking of a joke. So this is a detrus non detrusor instability like a diurnal frequency or sensory urgency. So urge syndrome is a problem also known as overactive bladder. Uh, is uh, mainly daytime voiding uh, and they have this uh, Vincent's curtsy sign, urgency and they often hold up the sphincter to control the urine. So they often have spontaneous resolution. Uh, sometimes you may have to give them a course of anticholinergics and feed the constipation. Now spinning top urethra is a classical appearance which is seen in these children that is due to external sphincter hyperactivity. Now lazy bladder syndrome is something where these children do not pass urine. They are often afraid of a dirty toilet in the school or elsewhere or the toilet is in a remote place uh, in, a, in a dark area in the back of the house and uh, they often hold the urine and they lead to large bladders. Now uroflometry is an important uh, part. It's a non-invasive test, a simple test, and uh, Euroflow nomograms are available. So the, the, the curves you see there are typical normal curves, the bell-shaped curves. Now, urge syndrome, the last graph is what we need to notice. It's a tower-shaped curve where, you know, they have a high rise in pressure. They quickly void. They have small volumes, but frequent voidings. Then, detrusor sphincter dysynergia is characterized by staccato voiding. That means, if you see in the last curve, that is a intrapred voiding. 
now medications anti muscular medications like um, anticholinergic drugs then alpha blockers tricyclic antidepressants all of them are used and the anti muscular agents are gold standard in the treatment of overactive bladder the, the ones like oxybutynin may have some side effects and may also worsen the constipation so you may have to add them on laxatives so alpha blockers are rarely used in those with bladder neck dysfunction tricyclic antidepressants we don't know the, how it works but sometimes it is helpful and the cholinergic drugs are very rarely used now biofeedback is a procedure a technique where uh, the children are taught about squeezing and relaxing of the pelvic floor using uh, various aids like this so they have the pads applied and using the computer they are able to learn to watch the computer and relax the muscles now monosymptomatic nocturnal neurosis or bed wetting is de defined as involuntary voiding during sleep more than two nights per week at least three consecutive months in a child aged 5 years or older without neurological problem so 5 to 10 percent of 7 year old children uh, have this but it gets better over the years and by the end of 15 years uh, only 1 percent of them have it so that means there's a resolution rate and uh, there's often a family history and it's often multifactorial now when you look at the causes of bed wetting it can be because of a nocturnal polyuria that means they produce the same amount of urine uh, like the daytime during the night also or it can be because of the bladder instability in this condition they will have a daytime symptoms also or it can be a pure arousal problem where they go to a deep sleep so it's often genetic and uh, so as I said these are the various components of uh, the problem so when they have nocturnal polyuria they wait soon after going to sleep they are often large patches and they, they have dry nights only if the child wakes up to toilet and um, the weak urine concentration so osmolality can be an aid to diagnose this so bladder instability they have a sense of urgency during the day also so daytime frequency low ward volumes multiple wettings at night variable size of the wet patch and they often wake up after the wetting in the night so lack of arousal means they sleep deeply throughout the wetting and inability to wake up from the sleep so how to choose the treatment so if it is a nocturnal polyuria component then you need to put them on a desmopressin if it is a bladder instability you have to, they have daytime symptoms you have to put them on anticholinergics and if it is a lack of arousal you have to give them alarms star charts so self-help measures have at least six to seven drinks stop drinking two hours before the sleep and then avoid bladder stimulants like coffee blackcurrant various things and ensure easy access to the bathroom uh, good lighting in that area then rewards like star charts or gifts for dry nights and encourage the child to participate in changing the bed and minimize the odor. So it, it's, it's not helpful to uh, scold the child or punish the child, but it's rather helpful to reward the child. So desmopressin uh, is useful in certain conditions where there is there's a low urinosmolality and that's typically uh, useful only during the uh, time when you take the tablet. So you have to warn the parents that once they stop, the desmopressin may come back, but they can automatically get better over a period of time. So anticholinergics, so if they have daytime symptoms also, frequency urgency, they can get better, and they often have to be given um, laxatives along with this. Alarms, uh, in our place, the alarms are mainly for the family. So the entire family wakes up. Uh, and that is not the ideal alarm. The ideal neurosis alarm is a small portable alarm worn on the body at the bedtime to prevent, uh, to give the child a, a tactile alarm like a vibration other than a big noise to wake up the entire bed. So the goal is to beat the buzzer and wake up when the bladder feels full before the alarm goes off. So multiple alarms are available in the market and uh, with that, um, you know, the child can probably learn uh, how to uh, get get up out of the bed before the alarm actually goes off so average duration of success is around six to ten weeks and uh, with these all these measures uh, one can easily uh, cure the important problem of wetting in the child thank you